fiends, welcome once again to another edition of the Ministry of Horror. I'm your host, as per always, Tez, and uh, we are back once again, getting another episode out um, on the usual sort of Friday that I tend to aim to get them, if not recorded, then at least out. It's been a little bit late the last uh, couple of weeks through various things, but we're back. It's been <laughs> a week of horror um my goodness my goodness what i need to kind of catch up on what i have watched so far for the 31 days of horror challenge let me have a little uh refresher to give me myself give myself an idea of uh where i got to on mentioning on the last show so i'm sure i'd got to uh it came from tubi which was festival of living dead which is you know, it's a tubi film uh lovecraftian I uh, what did I watch for Lovecraft? Oh God, what did I watch for Lovecraft? I'm gonna have to scroll through. I'm gonna have to scroll through to remind myself. Fortunately, I put it in the uh, the Discord. Uh, wow, has a lot gone on since then. So, Andre Ejaculator, yeah, 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 yeah. First of all, and Dell's my tube tick. So, I went for Beyond Reanimator, which is actually pretty good. Um, I hadn't seen it before, the third film in the Reanimator series, but um, yeah, it's on Arrow, and it's got some pretty good gore effects in it. Um, Brian Yun's a film, it's pretty good. Tales from the, I went for Tales from the Lodge. I thought it was a nice little um, British black comedy. Not little bits of horror elements in there, but it wasn't really horror horror. Um, but it's got a lot of the favourites that you'll have seen on TV shows and bit parts. I suppose the most notable is like Johnny Vegas and um, Mackenzie Crook. But that I, I look, I quite like that. Werewolves, not swearwolves. I went for I forgot what it's called, but it's a new one starring Jon Snow from Game of Thrones, Beastly or something like that. Wasn't very good. And uh, Barbara Crampton's today, and I watched Reborn, which is on Prime, and isn't very good. It's basically like a kind of a ripoff of Carrie to an extent, and has a very similar... I don't, I'm, I'm assuming it's a homage, not a straight ripoff at the very end of the film. But, uh, <laughs> you know, they're not all going to be winners, are they? Um, but I have got three films that we're going to be reviewing today. So these aren't films that feature on my tier not tier list my action list for 31 days of halloween uh they're just horror films that have either just come out that i've been able to catch or i've just seen on on streaming services dropping recently so we're gonna have a review of daddy's head which dropped on shudder we are gonna also review mr crockett which is currently on disney plus or, or hulu if you're in the states and then we will have a review of damien leone's terrifier 3 all of that to come later on. Um, Gaming-wise, I have done a little bit of gaming as well. Ooh, busy, busy boy. Uh, I finally just succumbed and got uh, Silent Hill 2. Digital copy, because for some reason, the physical copy has just been out of stock, like, everywhere. Uh, which is great for, you know, for sales. Um, but I'd prefer to get it on physical. And I was too impatient because it was just out of stock every time I checked. So um, I've been playing a bit of that. And I don't remember a huge amount of the original game. I played the original game the one time, played through it once, completed it. I don't really replay games for uh, multiple endings. I just, I'm, I'm a narrative based gamer. I like just to get the story. And I appreciate that there are different ways the story can go based on different actions you take. But. Um, I usually find once I've finished a game, I don't have that interest to jump back into it to get the achievements or to go for New Game Plus or whatever it is. So it is pretty fresh to me, I must say, and I'm enjoying that. Like, it's uh, it's pretty damn scary. The sound design in it is just so creepy. Even before you've encountered your first enemy, just walking through the town, there's this horrible... <laughs> sort of sound that really just gets under your skin um so i've been enjoying playing that whether i'll jump on the stream with that probably probably not but i will look at doing a bit of uh game streaming 
at some point. We've still got um, It Lies the Deep, still lies the deep on on Xbox to uh, resume at some point. Uh, I don't know. I just haven't really been feeling, haven't really been feeling Twitch uh, for a while. So I'm in no rush. I'm in no rush, but uh, we'll see. Uh, anyway, without further ado, it's time to jump into the horror news. This is the news. Oh, 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 oh. There we go. Horror news time, people. As per usual, all the horror news comes from bloodydisgusting.com. Be sure to check them out for your latest bits of horror news, editorials, reviews, etc., etc. Um, this one comes from John Squires, and these are four new horror movies being released this past week. So, from the team behind the Terrifier movies, Stream was released in theatres back in August, and the gory horror movie made its debut on digital outlets, including Amazon Today. Director Michael Levy's Stream comes from Fuzz on the Lens Productions, uh, with the film's makeup effects being handled by Terrify and Terrify 2 director Damien Leone. Leone? Leone? Don't know. Uh, the film's cast is stacked with familiar faces and horror icons, including Tony Todd, Jeffrey Coombs, Danielle Harris, Tim Reed, uh, D. Wallace... Mark Halton, Felicia Rose, Daniel Roebuck, Dave Sheridan, Terry Alexander, David Howard Thornton, Charles Edwin Powell, Bob Adrian, Sidney Malake, 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 uh, Wesley Holloway, and Damien Maffei. Bill Mosley will also appear in the upcoming Gorefest. Stream is a modernised slasher made by horror fans for horror fans, and we are extremely excited and honoured to be bringing this movie to the big screen for audiences to enjoy together, uh, Levy tells Variety. We have an incredible cast of genre greats who deliver stellar performances, and of course having terrifies Damien Leone and Phil Falcone heading the gore effects, we made sure we delivered the goods for our incredible fan base, but something we are most proud of is its story and arc in character development. In the film, as the Keenans try to bring their family closer together, they unwittingly enter themselves into a game of life and death. Um, life or death, I should say. With four deranged killers patrolling the halls of their hotel and competing for the most creative kills, the odds are definitely stacked against them. Uh, I caught the trailer for this a few weeks back, and um, I like the look of it. Now, has it dropped in the UK? That is... Uh... So that is the question. Get a prime video. Stream. Okay, well, you can buy it on prime video for £20. So that must be a. Um, no, it doesn't. It doesn't even say it's a premiere price. It just is £20, which is a little bit rich for a digital only copy, I would say. Next, after scaring up $350 million at the box office, Alien Romulus has been unleashed at home via all major digital outlets this week. The movie is next hitting 4K UHD Blu-ray and DVD December 3rd. Director Fede Alvarez takes the phenomenally successful Alien franchise back to its iconic roots in the next jaw-dropping instalment, heralded by critics as sheer terror and utterly breathtaking. In Alien Romulus, while scavenging the deep ends of a derelict space station, a group of young space colonizers come face to face with the most terrifying life form in the universe. Kylie Spaney leads the cast alongside Isabella Merced, David Johnson, Archie Renault, Spike Fern, and Eileen Wu. Fede Alvarez co-wrote the script with Rodo Sayigs. Uh, Ridley Scott is on board as producer of the film, the first movie in the franchise to be released by Disney. Thoroughly enjoy this film. I'll definitely be picking up the physical copy when it comes out in uh, December. Um, and also really looking forward to this month receiving, hopefully, um, although I, don't, I can't remember the store that I pre-ordered it from, uh, hopefully receiving it, uh, the comic book, which should bridge the gap a little bit between... Uh, the, I don't know at what point it starts, but bridge the opening part uh, that we saw in Romulus versus where the main action kind of kicks in. Um, yeah, interesting. Next up, looking like a twist on Alfred Hitchcock's uh, thriller, classic Rear Window, for the screen life generation, nine windows is now available on VOD outlets at home from Gravitas Ventures. Uh, written and directed by Lou Simon, the new screen lifestyle horror movie stars William Forsyth, Michael Paré, Diana, Diana Garley, Christopher Milan, and Jason Hignight. 
On the day of her graduation, Lisa and her parents are driving to a restaurant to celebrate when a truck slams into their car. 18 months later, Lisa is unable to walk and lives alone after her parents' death. 18 months later, fuck, okay, I've read that line again. Um, feeling responsible, Lisa spends her days trolling vloggers on a local website. Late one night, a new video uh, is uploaded in which a man sets fire to a dog. She reports it to the police, but the police detective, Boyle, cannot be bothered with a misdemeanor. However, when videos start popping up showing the gruesome murders of humans, Boyle finally agrees to consult a retired FBI agent to help them track down the killer. As the murders continue, Lisa figures out the killer is copying the most gruesome serial killers of all time. She finds the killer's reflection on the knife he used in the second murder and finds out the identity of the murderer, but has she inadvertently become his next target? Yeah, I mean, that sounds interesting enough for a little thriller. I mean, it's not hugely original, but transposing the past into the modern age is nothing new. So, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't hate that. <laughs> high praise right there i don't hate the sound of that um i think it could be it could be all right it could be all right next up victoria justice and dermot mulroney star in depravity on digital today from paramount paul tamsey wrote and directed depravity in the thriller when three residents suspect their reclusive neighbors a serial killer they break into his apartment only to uncover a hidden fortune in stolen art but their discovery turns into a nightmare as they're ensnared in a sadistic game of survival where every corner hides a new horror outsmart the killer or become his next victim taylor john smith devon ross alex rowe adam lazier white and sasha Luce also star um uh, yeah i mean i've heard of people involved in this that's dropping on paramount now is that paramount plus in the uk i didn't notice depravity on there when i went on for my catfish fix um let's have a quick look let's have a quick look highly professional on the podcast i know um so curfew the beast within that's the crap i watched um doesn't look like it doesn't mean we won't get it but doesn't look like it yeah and then finally, FX brings American Horror Story spin-off American Horror Stories back this week with a special five-episode event as part of Hulu's annual Huluween festivities. All five episodes of the Huluween event will drop on Tuesday, October 15th on Hulu and via Hulu on Disney Plus for bundle subscribers yeah, for bundle subscribers in the US. The series will also premiere October 15th on Disney Plus in Canada and will be coming to Disney Plus internationally. The anthology series features a different horror story each episode. This cast, uh, this year's cast includes Michael Imperioli, Henry Winkler, Dylan, Dillion Burnside, Debbie Ryan, Jeff Hiller, Jessica Barden, uh, Angel Bismarck Curiel, Guy Burnett, Victor Garbe, and June Squibb. Uh, I keep meaning to watch. Um, there's an, there was a clip, and it turns out it's from American Horror Stories, that was on like Instagram Reels the other week, and it did look pretty creepy. It was where a uh, a bullied girl um, meets on, I guess, like a chat roulette or Omegle or something type of uh, program. This girl, this unfortunately to say the term, quite heavily deformed girl, and uh, they they meet a, make up a friendship, but it all just seems incredibly creepy. There's something kind of nefarious and not right there. I looked at the comments and it mentioned it's an episode of American Horror Stories um, called Bestie. And I keep meaning to check that out because I watched the very first episode of American Horror Stories, which was kind of like a continuation of uh, the story from season one of the, the first you know, American Horror Story. But again, it was focusing on the ghost element, and I just, I've never really been that interested in how ghosts are portrayed in American Horror Story because it's like, well, they're basically humans that everyone can see. They can interact and murder people, but then there's just certain rules like, oh, yeah, they are actually dead and. Oh yeah, they are sort of tied to this location, but they can do everything that a human can do and seem like a human. I don't really get that. That sort of takes for me takes away any of the spookiness of ghosts. But I have heard that there are some pretty good episodes, some pretty creepy uh, stories in there. So I need to give it a go. And there is a new show actually from Ryan Murphy on there called Grotesquery, which I haven't really heard much about, but um, I do need to give that a start as well. Next up, Stephen King's Fairy Tale is getting a 10-episode series adaptation from A24. 
Stephen, and this is from uh, John Squires. Stephen King's novel Fairy Tale has been set for a movie adaptation from Universal, you may recall, but it looks like those plans have changed. The new plan? Television series. Deadline reports today that A24 is now on board to turn Stephen King's fairy tale into a 10 episode series with J.H. Wyman of Fringe serving as the showrunner. The outlet notes Paul Greengrass, who wrote a script and expected to direct the original planned feature, is expected to still be in the middle of things. The script will be expanded by Greengrass and J.H. Wyman. Peter Rice will be executive producer alongside Greengrass, Wyman and King. Deadline further explains the book clocked in at 600 plus pages. It was impossible to fold it all into a two hour film. Universal let it go. Rice, who had read and loved the book, put it all back together at A24, with Greengrass remaining and Wyman joining him. Stephen King's novel is an epic tale that follows a 17-year-old boy who inherits the keys to a terrifying world where good and evil are at war. The stakes could not be higher for that world and ours as he journeys into the mythic roots of human storytelling. King recently said of the inspiration behind the novel, I saw a vast deserted city, deserted but alive. I saw the empty streets, the haunted buildings, a gargoyle head lying overturned in the street. I saw smashed statues of what I don't know, what I didn't know, but I eventually found out. I saw a huge sprawling palace with glass towers so high their tops pierced the clouds. I saw a magic sundial that could turn back time. Those images released the story I wanted to tell. I've read Fairy Tale. It's it's decent. It's one of um it's one of Stephen King's and I really enjoy Stephen King's uh, recent output. I find it very, very quick to read, I suppose. Uh, not to say I've lasted through 600 pages in a day, because that's not possible. I'm a slow reader. But in terms of... Um, they just seem, I guess, slightly simplified to uh, his writing in like the 80s and 90s, and I think that is a good thing because it's so much easier to get engrossed with these characters. And I, I yes, they don't have the same depth that something like It or, or even Tommyknockers. I know a lot of people don't like that, but even Tommyknockers, um, because he isn't focusing so much on like 30 pages of exposition. The story moves at, at a pace. It is a quite a thin plot, um, but I really did enjoy the world. It, it's one of his novels that I enjoyed. But kind of like the Institute, kind of like the Mr. Mercedes trilogy, I, I, I enjoyed them. I really, I really liked them. Do I see myself in the next five, ten years picking it up again? I mean, maybe, but at the moment, it's kind of like I've enjoyed that. On to the next one. Uh, it's not like something like the Salem's Lot that I'm keen to revisit at some point. But good if you like. Um, if you like Stephen King's writing, but this isn't so much on horror. It's more of his uh, kind of modern fantasy but blended with um a bit of a bit of thriller a bit of action it's worth a go so an a24 series yeah i'm interested in that uh next up john squires writes carved hulu unleashes a man-eating pumpkin with retro star teaser for huluween original in the wake of mr crockett Hulu's Huluween lineup continues this month with the original horror comedy Carved, and we've been provided with a retro style teaser trailer today. Uh, dig into the nasty pumpkin guts below. The horror comedy Carved premieres only on Hulu Monday, October 21st. When a heartbroken teenage playwright, her younger brother, and a disparate group of survivors become trapped in a historical reenactment village on Halloween night, they must band together to survive a relentless assault by a sentient and vengeful pumpkin. Uh, Painton Elizabeth Lee, Corey Fogel Manis, Wyatt Lindler, and a number of other people star in the upcoming <laughs> Halloween horror movie Carved. Directed by Justin Harding, Carved is based on the short film of the same name, which he also wrote and directed for a short program for Huluween Film Fest, and teamed up with writer Cheryl Mayer to pen the feature version together. Um, I mean, if we get this in the UK on Disney+, Plus, and Disney+, Plus doesn't have a huge amount of horror, or more specifically, I suppose, modern horror. I mean, that said, it had... Um, it's had quite recent releases like uh, the first omen but it doesn't seem to have like regular releases on there i don't know how much of hulu's output is guaranteed to go to disney plus or star is the kind of the channel on disney plus but yeah i mean i'm bored and i need to if if on my 31 days of halloween i've got to watch a pumpkin themed horror film then i'll i'll check it out not that fast uh, gaming news next. Phasmophobia comes to play PS5, PSVR2, and Xbox Series on October 29th. 
Just as promised, Phasmophobia, and this comes from Mike Wilson, I should say. Just as promised, Phasmophobia fans who've been waiting for what seems like forever for the game to hit PlayStation and Xbox will finally have release on, on relief on October 29th. Players on PS5, PSVR2, Xbox Series, and Steam will finally be able to team up with friends to enjoy the exhilaration of hunting for and being hunted by a range of ghosts, ghouls, and spirits on whatever platform they play on. The PlayStation Xbox release is still the early access version, with the full version of Phasmophobia expected on all platforms later this year. We're so happy to see Phasmophobia enter consoles early access, says Daniel Knight, CEO and lead developer at Kinetic Games. The community has been asking for console versions and has waited a little while for it to happen. The development team at Kinetic Games have worked exceptionally hard to make this request a reality. To further celebrate, there will be a Halloween special event that, for the first time, will include a community goal orientated task where players on all platforms can work together to permanently unlock the Blood Moon weather in the game. Additionally, players will be able to earn a new badge and trophy by completing different community goals. Lastly, the PS version, PC version, I should say, will also be receiving an update which will improve general performance, fix community reported bugs, as well as implementing a new event board with new challenges and rewards. So, years ago, well, yeah, probably a couple of years ago now, I picked up Phasmophobia on the PC. Because I'd heard buzz about it, everyone was banging on about it at the time. This was when it was hot shit and it was all over the place um you, you never want hot shit all over the place uh, and um i i jumped into it but i i i don't know if it was naivety i had just hadn't completely looked into the fact that it is a purely multiplayer game so i was jumped dropped into a random game with a bunch of randoms none of which were using microphones um and a lot of the game seems to kind of hinge on communication and uh you know doing an investigation and you almost basically need someone who's already played it to kind of lead the group if you're a newbie didn't have that so i was there like I, i've no idea what i'm doing everyone's just gone off and i'm kind of just trying to figure out what i need to do and picking up stuff and it was it wasn't very fun at all um so i, I don't imagine i don't imagine it'll be that much fun on consoles but I don't know. I mean, if you've got a group, then I imagine it's good fun to play. Um, yeah, not for me. Probably not. And last up in the horror news, wrestler Charles Montgomery, or CM Punk, and Justin Long are starring in horror movie Night Patrol. It's from John Squires. Scream King Justin Long and WWE superstar CM Punk have been set to star in an upcoming horror movie titled Night Patrol, THR reports. Jermaine Fowler, Dermot Mulroney, RJ Seiler, Freddie Gibbs, YJ, Flying Lotus, John Oswald, and Nick Michaud will also star in the upcoming Night Patrol. In the horror thriller, an LAPD officer uh, must put aside his differences with the area street gangs when he discovers a local police task force is harboring a horrific secret that endangers the residents of the housing projects he grew up in. THR reports David S. Goyer and Keith Levine are producing via the duo's Phantom 4 banner. Also producing is Josh Goldblum, known for the recent VHS horror entries. James Harris and Mark Lane of T-Shop Films are also producing the movie, which wrapped principal photography in Los Angeles this week. Ryan Prose uh, directed the film and also wrote the script with Shay Og Ogbona, uh, Tim Cairo and Jake Gibson. Audiences are not ready for how hard this movie goes. To shoot this script with this cast on location in LA after such a long path to get here is nothing short of a dream, Prowl's teases. I mean, it's a Justin Long horror release. He is a Scream King. Uh, mm -hmm. CM Punk. I, 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 did try, I did try and watch Girl on the Third Floor. I didn't really give it a proper chance. Didn't really know what was going on. Maybe I need to give him another chance to um, you know, give him a chance as an actor but i'm a fan of him his as a wrestler so who knows um but yeah interesting uh cast and crew the, the the kind of blurb doesn't really give too much away of what the horrifying secret is but uh i'm interested i'm gonna keep an eye out for that one right girls and fiends that is it for the horror news that was the news so, ho, ho. There we go. We, blitzing through. This is a lean episode, that's for sure. Uh, right. 
Right, right, right. Let's start off in the reviews. Now, first up in the reviews, I caught earlier this week the Shudder original, I believe, Daddy's Head, 2024 release. Daddy's Head was uh, written and directed by Benjamin Barfoot, starring Rupert Turnbull, Julia Brown, Charles Aitken. Uh, this is a Shudder original, and typically it doesn't have a Wikipedia. We've just got a small blurb on... Um, IMDb. So... We'll kind of do what we usually do. I'll read a bit about the film, or in this instance, a blurb and what I remember. And then we'll go into the highs, the lows, and I'll give it a score out of 10. So, a boy and his stepmother fear for their safety after an eerie creature resembling the boy's recently deceased father visits them. That's all it says on IMDb. Okay, let's talk about highs and lows now. Okay, so the film opens with a young boy and what what turns out to be his stepmother visiting a hospital where a severely injured man wrapped in bandages is in a hospital bed fast forward then to the uh, the funeral and uh, on their drive back to this really sprawling um house in the middle of nowhere they go past a an area that has been cordoned off with police tape. So that sort of suggests it may have been a um, catastrophic car accident or bike accident, but some sort of accident along that stretch of road. That's the implication that I kind of got there. Um, she isn't really adjusted to having a child. Um, the kid is now technically an orphan, as his mum had previously passed away. So there's a little bit of kind of tension there. And uh, on one of the days when they're just hanging out, and they've got a nice dog as well, I should mention, uh, all of a sudden, out in the woods, there's a huge amount of smoke, huge plumes of smoke appearing. Police can't find any evidence of where the smoke has come from. But then there seems to be this creature that appears in their house that scurries away when confronted. And when chased into the woods, there's this structure made out of wood and trees that just looks like it's 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 just a very very not natural it's like uh an architecture an architecturist uh, an architect god <laughs> struggling with words then an architect's version of a tree house it was this crazy structure but that's when we start <laughs> interacting with this this thing which is appearing to take the appearance um, of the boy's deceased dad. So when we talk about tone of this film, I think the first thing that I can say is Babadook. In terms of, you're going to be questioning, well, is this thing real? Or is this thing like a... Um, a metaphor of grief and loss and PTSD or trauma. Um, I didn't. I I, I I remember when I watched Babadook and I liked it for its creepiness, but I I hated the end of that film and I hated the kid in that film. Um, so I didn't. By the end of it, I just didn't really like the film. Um, this I think was a little better, but in terms of I mean, I think all the performances are good. I will give it that. But in terms of just kind of like story, it th by the end of it, it just feels kind of like pointless. Like, what was the purpose of this? Um, it doesn't really feel like it's leading up to any anything. Like, even the finale, there's a bit of a coda at the end, a bit of a coda or an epilogue, whatever the correct term is, that... <sighs> I just thought to myself, is this meant to mean anything or has this just ended as it's ended? Like, is there meant to be some sort of subtext there? And I don't think there is. You don't have to have subtext, but it was just like, okay, is, is that's it then? What was the point of the last hour and a half? Um, yeah, it wasn't really for me. It shot well. Um, I believe it's a British production. Uh, the sets look great. The acting is good in it. 
like there's no one that's poor but in terms of like the point of the narrative it didn't really do anything for me like there's a couple of creepy moments but then the creature scurries away all the time so it's like what's it what i don't get what it's what it's trying to do i don't really understand it it was like well, we've got creepy ideas but in 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 in, in reality on practicality it's like well, what are we trying to do here middle of the road five out of ten for daddy's head if you've got shudder and you're looking for something new to watch it's there there's far worse things on shudder but I don't know. I didn't really get anything out of it, to be honest. Five out of ten, Daddy said. Next up, the Hulu original from the Huluween series, Mr. Crockett. So I saw the trailer for this doing the news a week or two back. And when I'd gone on Disney Plus the other day, I saw this was in the uh, new editions. I thought, really? Okay, give it a watch. So... Mr. Crockett, directed by Brandon S.B., written by Carl Reed of Brandon um, S.B., stars Jerrica Hinton, Aidan Gavin, Crystalline Lloyd. It's a 2024 release, and again, there's no Wikipedia page. So uh, we'll read the brief blurb, then I'll sort of talk a bit about what happens in the film. A mother embarks on a perilous quest to rescue her son from a demonic children's show host who is kidnapping kids. Um... So Mr. Crockett, with its almost John Carpenter's The Thing intro uh, intro title. Um, this... F okay, we'll talk about the plot first. So there's a, a boy who is eating or not eating his dinner uh, with his mother and I think his stepfather. Stepfather is being quite verbally abusive um kicking off because the son the stepson won't eat his dinner to the point of basically saying you're gonna disrespect me in my house you know eat the food and force feeding him and so on and so forth the, the the mother can't deal with this she goes off to the bedroom well the boy had been watching this videotape of uh the mr crockett show or something along those lines and uh basically think the fiend uh well not the fiend but just think um the bray wyatt tv show character from uh from wwe it's this children's tv host um that all seems nicey nicey on the tv but then we get some pretty interesting little um physical effects and vfx in this um in terms of he the tv's playing but then something's clearly going amiss because he starts looking into the tv into the camera lens and uh and focusing in on what's actually happening before you then see on the VHS player his eyes appear at the, the mouth of the VHS where the tapes go. Next thing you know, he's walking into their house and the stepfather, his chair has turned into this monster that has bitten down on his arms and has like this massive mouth of razor sharp teeth right behind him. Like the effects of the kind of creatures in this do look very, very cool. They look like something straight out of like an 80s horror. I really did enjoy that. Um things happen and the son is kidnapped essentially into this magical world um this basically is kind of like a uh an extreme version of like are you afraid of the dark or goosebumps that's probably the easiest way that i can explain it like it's it's got that kind of madcap energy of story but it's not the sort of story that you'd have probably seen in um you know tales from the dark side or um the twilight zone that i'm aware of it's more kind of like that silliness of a story that would appear in more of a kid's horror series, like Are You Afraid of the Dark? But this time with gore. Um, we then jump to this new family, the recently deceased father and uh, mother struggling with her son. Son's been a bit of a... He's been a brat, basically. He's just being... Um, you know, he's dealing with his own trauma and doesn't really know how to handle it and the mother is struggling and whatnot. Which then leads into uh, one day a... Um, a post box being left outside her house that's got books and vhs's in it and one of them is this uh mr crockett video that she shows her son and things go on from there um performances are pretty good in this like the guy that plays mr crockett who is let's have a little look D -d -d elvis nolasco I thought he was brilliant as this just deranged individual 
Uh, really good at doing, especially in the veiny, not veiny, in the uh, grainy VHS tape moments where he's doing the TV show, you know, kids TV show host, and then being maniacal when he's uh, in the real world going on a murder spree. I think he did that really, really well. Um, everyone else like, was pretty good in this, actually. Like, I did enjoy this more than I was expecting. The story itself is kind of threadbare, but the, like I say, the, the action in it, or the moments, uh, the kills, were pretty good. And the monsters themselves, I, did, I, I dug their appearance. I thought it was quite unique and original. Um, as I say, story isn't much to write home about, but it's a decent little way to pass an hour and a half. Um, and I had fun with it. The music's pretty good. Uh, I think the finale was actually quite good, and the kind of the the epilogue, really nice, really nice moment in the final few minutes. There's also a cool um, a cool bit of backstory where we find out some information via a story, by a voiceover and backstory, and that is played out as cartoon characters. And I thought that was a really, really neat way to do that. Um, explained how things have occurred. So n you do get answers in this, and I, I like that. Sometimes ambiguity is nice. Sometimes there's too much ambiguity, so it's just like, well, they had no idea what they were doing. This, it's kind of straight to the point, and that's why, again, I kind of feel like it's like a, an adult version of a Goosebumps episode, something like that. Uh, I'm going to give it... I'm giving it 6.5 out of 10 for Mr. Crockett. There's far worse new films on streaming services. Um, and yeah, I thought it was, it was pretty decent. Mr. Crockett, 6.5 out of 10 on the Ministry of Horror. And then finally, Ghouls and Fiends. The film that none of my friends wanted to watch in the cinema because they were too intimidated. Terrifier 3. Just look at that artwork. Um, Terrifier 3. It's a 2024 American Christmas supernatural slasher film written and directed by Damien Leone and starring Lauren Levera, David Howard Thornton, Elliot Fulham, Samantha Scafidi, Antonella Rose, Margaret Ann Florence, and Bryce Johnson. On the days leading up to Christmas, the story follows Sienna Shaw as she attempts to rebuild her life. At the same time, Art the Clown is pursuing her alongside his new accomplice, a possessed Victoria Hayes. It is the sequel to Terrifier 2 and is the third installment in the franchise. So, if you've seen Terrifier 2, you may have wondered... Apologies for the dogs. You may have wondered, how are they doing a sequel um, based, on, based on what happens at the end of the second film? Well, you may be asking questions about what actually happened at the end of the second film because Art the Clown is decapitated by Sienna um only to then be born somehow by victoria hayes who is uh this demonic entity god the dogs are now howling the howling is new the barking isn't but the howling is new <laughs> I don't know if you're hearing this. If you're not, you're probably thundering what I'm doing, but the dogs are going crazy downstairs. So, um, <laughs> after being decapitated by Sienna Shaw, Art the Clown's headless body makes its way to the asylum, where survivor Victoria Hayes, now possessed by the little pale girl, has just given birth to its head. To his head. They kill a nurse and a guard before fleeing to an abandoned house. Now, the guard is played by, um, you guessed it, frontman of Fuzzy and wrestling legend Chris Jericho. Um, who, I've seen him do some sort of decent acting here and there in the past. He's, he's pretty funny in his small role in MacGruber. His acting is worse in this than Terrifier 2. He's only in it very shortly, but his acting is not good. Uh, they kill a, guard, a nurse and a guard before fleeing to an abandoned house. Victoria smashes her face into a bath, bathroom mirror, using a shard of broken glass to slit her wrists. Entering hibernation in a bathtub, while Art sits in a rocking chair in the attic, the two become dormant. Uh, 
Five years later, Sienna is released from a mental hospital, a uh, mental health centre, I should say, to stay with her aunt, Jess, who lives with her husband, Greg, and their daughter, Gabby, who idolises Sienna but has no knowledge of the events she endured. Sienna is suffering from survivor guilt and frequently has hallucinations of her deceased best friend, Brooke, whose death she feels responsible for. She struggles to reconnect with her younger brother, Jonathan, Jonathan who is now in college trying to move on with his life. Art and Victoria awoken from their slumber when two demolition workers stumble upon them in the house. Okay. We won't read too much more further into that. Um, but obviously, the moments, the moments of the kills played out very briefly in this blurb. They are not brief in the film. Um... If you, I, I kind of think that this is a, a little blending of of Terrifier one and and two to an extent. Uh, one only in so much as we get quite a lot more of um, Art when he's between his his moments when he's sort of planning his actions to, to an extent. Um, it felt like with two, even though two is quite a long film, a lot of the Art focus was when he was going in for a kill we got some more kind of in betweeny moments here that i don't think we had in in two maybe i need to give it a rewatch but i'm not in a rush because it is quite violent um the gore is is up there with uh with i'm, I'm just gonna say with the second i i've i've seen the first one it wasn't really for me um but i can't remember other than one kill i can't remember too much about it but the second film it's it's up there with the gore I don't know if I'd necessarily say there was anything in this particularly that I thought, holy shit, that is way more extreme than anything that we've seen in the previous film. But, um, but it is pretty gnarly. Now, Victoria Hayes being possessed by the little pale girl, I hadn't picked up on that. I know that she does things at the end of the second film but i hadn't picked up on there being a transference to the little pale girl uh there is dialogue to kind of give some hints at at what is going on to an extent but not to not not so much as to kind of make the storytelling super clear and i think that's fine we still don't know exactly who art the clown is it, we don't know anything about really about his backstory but in terms of this little pale girl entity, because I was wondering what what happened to the little pale girl from the the second film. But that's I guess sort of explained there. I don't I didn't pick that up in the in the film. I should say, um, it it looks great. It's still got that look and tone of the second film. Uh, Lauren Levera is really really good in this again. David Hound Thornton is just you know round of applause for his performance. He is. Uh, he is absolutely excellent as Art the Clown. Um, I think the only thing that really kind of stuck out for me, and I have read up afterwards about this, was there is a particular fate that um, occurs off screen uh, in the film. And I did sort of wonder, was that like a bait and switch? But I don't think it was. And... I have read as to the reasons why that decision was made, and I get it, but it did just feel a bit kind of odd. It did sort of make it seem more like, well, there's got to be alternate reasons why that didn't happen, considering there's kind of no one off limits in this film. You may have heard reports or seen online about um, there's a bit of an uproar about uh, a particular victim. Uh, you don't see it on screen. You see the aftermath, though. <laughs> and that's messed up. But it doesn't happen, like, on screen. There's not gratuity in that. Um, you know. But understandable, because it is messed up. That's the thing. This this is a gore fest. Um, and I never thought I'd be a gore fiend. And I certainly don't still think I'm... I still think I'm not a gore fiend. But I had a great time with this. And yes, there were a few moments where I was physically wincing, uh, looking away and uh, try, you know, I didn't really look away, but I might have looked away just to see other people's reactions. And there were a few people covering their eyes. Um, I think the finale fight is is excellent. And that shouldn't be a spoiler. There's a fight because there's a fight in the second film. Um, 
and yeah we we do similar to the second film we do get some peppering in of backstory backstory here and there but nothing too obvious um yeah it's a great time the music's great in it there was definitely some cool new additions um in terms of there was one particular bit of music and i don't know if it's marked down anywhere but there's this guy who does synth music on instagram that i followed for a little while and instantly when uh, a bit of the score changed to this synthy sort of feel i thought that's definitely that's definitely him um i can't remember his name but uh, it's definitely him. And I looked online, and yeah, he did get uh, he did get that. So fair play. Um, the fact that this is or has been the number one film in America is just such a massive achievement, considering you know the budget on this one was two million, and considering the second film was like two hundred fifty grand. Um, so it's a much bigger budget for the film, but in the grand scheme of things, like blockbusters, it's minuscule, and it's already raked in thirty million um in in what a week that's that's incredible so it's a huge achievement um i'm gonna give this one I'm gonna give this one a solid 8.5 out of 10 terrifier 3 if you are squeamish if the the first two terrifier films weren't for you then this won't be for you i could just say that that right now i mean if you enjoyed the second film you'll enjoy this if you watched the first film didn't like it try the second film you might have a different opinion me and, and you might not but um i i think this is <laughs> this is a huge achievement um it works great as a companion piece to the second film i definitely think that uh at some point i'll do a rewatch of uh of of the terrifier films but um not anytime soon i need a bit of time to recover i think and I, I can confirm that there was no one being sick or walking out of my screening. So I, I, I've heard reports of that happening. Maybe true, maybe media speculation, whatnot. But for my screening, it was a dry show. Uh, and that is it. Ghouls and Fiends once again for another edition of the Ministry of Horror. Thank you for checking out the show, whether you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, whether you're checking this out on YouTube. Give the show a follow on those channels or a subscribe, whatever whatever you use. It really does help. Uh, we're also on X, Ministry underscore Horror. Uh, also on TikTok, Ministry of Horror. Check it out. I haven't done a little TikTok in a while. I'll have a look this week and get some videos on up there. Uh, but until next time, ghouls and fiends, see you later.